Good morning, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to have you here um, and to welcome you to this introductory session on research degrees at University of the Arts in London. I'm the Dean of the Doctoral School, Peter Mitchell, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jane Nobbs, who's just going to do this little bit of housekeeping for us in terms of how to hold this space together. Jane. Hello everybody, welcome to our UAL Open event. I'm Jane Nobbs, I'm the Head of Postgrad Research at UAL, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about how we're going to run the session today. Your microphones and cameras are muted. Uh, you can accept live transcript if you require that. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions. We'll be answering some questions as we go along. Um, any very specific personal questions, we may ask you to email us to researchdegreesart.ac.uk so that we can take those separately. So watch out for our responses in the chat. General questions will, that apply to all of you will probably be saved until the end so that everybody can benefit from those answers. Do contact us, researchdegreesart.ac.uk, and please note that this session is being recorded. Thank you. And I now hand you back to Vida. Thank you, Jane. So this is our programme for the, today. We're just going to start from this, with um, really giving you an overview of UAL and what it might be like to be a research degree student with us, um, and then work through the programme leading toward, Jane said, some question and answer time at the end. Remembering, do you use that Q&A function? We'll try and answer questions as we go because um, there's a good number of you in the room today, so we might not be able to get to all of your questions at the end. Um, again, if you don't get to all your questions, um, please do email those to us. Um, so next slide, please. So we're just going to share with you a short video that really gives you a flavour of being a research student, being a student overall at UAL, and it's called We Are UAL. Oh, thank you. Um, so really just thinking about what it might be like to be at UAL and the video kind of gives us a sense of being um, a large university that sits across a number of campuses um, across London with a really diverse group of students. Um, so we are a large and specialist university. We encompass research um, and teaching and knowledge exchange activity that is in the area of the arts, design and the communication based disciplines and a really rich variety of approaches to those studies. So you'll be joining a community of researchers, researcher practitioners, artists and designers. 
So we currently have about 350 research degree students across our colleges. And they're in encompassing work that ranges right through from arts marketing and AI through to exploring pain and trauma in performance. Just to give you a few couple of examples, and you'll be hearing more examples as we go through today's presentation. So hopefully that might give you some inspiration for things you might like to research. So as the video was saying, we are one university made of six colleges and we're gonna be hearing from those colleges shortly to give you an idea of the work that's going on in our colleges and actually in our um, Creative Computing Institute as well. Um, but thinking about why come to UAL, um, you'd be joining um, a university with an amazing history and the reputation of those colleges. And our reputation has been recognized through these kind of things called world rankings and research excellent framework rankings, which are some of the ways in which you might be able to compare different universities in the UK. So we're second in the world for art and design in the um, world rankings, and we are top of art and design in the UK, according to the research excellence framework, which is a way of um, assessing the research outputs and the research environment of um, research in UK universities. We are also um, the proud recipient of the Queen's um, Anniversary Prize this year, and we're awarded that in February. And that prize was to recognise UAL's outstanding role in shaping the fashion industry, of working with designers and manufacturers, and shaping the discourse of fashion and sustainability. So there's just one, a couple of examples of um, the research environment and the strength of our research environment. We also have, as you might expect as a specialist institution, really specialist resources and facilities, including great archives, which you really be welcome to think about using in your research. So that'd be really worth exploring on our website um, if, as you explore what you might study with us. Next slide, please. So this just, these are images taken from our website of our uh, research institutes and some of our research centers. And we also have um, a collection of various other kinds of research centers and research groupings. But exploring those um, websites will really give you a flavor for the specialist research that's going on um, at UAL. But to just give you a couple of brief examples, the Decolonizing Arts Institute, the second image on the top line there, is working with our Creative Computing Institute on a large project that's really looking at how we can explore technology to um, understand collections and surface otherwise hidden, sometimes quite um, contentious narratives in our museum collections. And then the um, creative research into sound arts practice, the first slide um, in the second row, um, are working um, to really explore what we might mean by sounding knowledge, investigating the potential of sonic, sonic pedagogy and re rethinking what we mean by embodied and sensory knowledges. So this is just to give you a real flavor, hint of a flavour of some of the activity going on, but please, an invitation to explore our website to take that further. Next slide, please. So we're going to give you an opportunity to hear from each of our colleges, um, and they will each just say you a little bit about the specific things going on in those colleges, and perhaps give you an indication of kinds of research that you might want to undertake with them. So I'm going to hand over first to Professor Malcolm Quinn, who's going to speak about Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon Colleges of the Arts. Next slide and then over to you. Hello, thank you, Vida. Right. Hello, everyone. And uh, great to have you all with us. Uh, I'm Malcolm Quinn. I'm Associate Dean of Research for Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon, which is three colleges as one unit, as one quarter of the university. And uh, my role means that I look after research across the, th the three colleges and the PhD students as a community. Now, Vida mentioned research centres. The, res the research centre that's based with us 
is TRAIN, Transnational Art, Identity and Nation, which looks, as the name suggests, at transnational art practice, issues around migration, issues around curation, um, museology, and uh, radical uh, art, art and design practice. So that's worth noting as a centre based at um, Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon. I'm going to take you through a few of these um, images on the slide because they give you a flavour of what we're about. In the centre, you can see an image of our annual PhD student exhibition at the Triangle Space in Chelsea. And this, uh, this is something we do every year where students get together to showcase their research together. At the um, bottom uh, on my right, we've got Rudy Lowe. Uh, they are a current student who works with archival research and collected lived experience, such as oral histories, to envision alternative, alternative futures involving Black, queer and trans lives. And there's a mention of archives again, which Vida raised. On the top right on my uh, slide is an image from the an exhibition that was initiated by two of our current students, Rudy Lowe and Remy Allen. Uh, this was called the Chart, CH Art exhibition, again in the Triangle Space, which was a development of a publication that Remy and Srinivas did, initiated with others that explored the notion of brownness as a diverse and inclusive mode of cultural identification. At the bottom left, uh, a bit of an older image, it's from a project called Undoing, Redoing, Revolting, a feminist response to the special collections at Chelsea College of Arts. We've got a, a world-renowned special collection uh, of artist books at Chelsea. And this was a joint effort by current staff and PhD students to, um, to form a response to the archives uh, with a, through a feminist lens. Uh, so very much a collaborative project and uh, working with the archives and library team. At the top left is an image by one of our current students, Nell Luna. It's called Stabat Mater, a painting that was exhibited, exhibited, uh, exhibited at the Mother Art Prize in Camden recently, which was developed as part of uh, Nell's residency at the British School of Athens. We initiated at uh, Campbell Chelsea Wimbledon this residency collaboration with the British School of Athens, which uh, is offered to one PhD student at UAL uh, every year and supported by a £2,500 bursary and with studio accommodation, uh, studio and accommodation provided by the British School at Athens. That's just a flavour, but uh, obviously, you know, if you want, if you're applying the, you know, just just think think about some of these themes and think about how your research might connect with them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. And handing over to Rebecca Fortner. Hello. Um, apologies, I'm doing this from my phone. I don't know. Can you see and hear me? Okay. We can. Brilliant. Um, yeah, my name is Rebecca Fortnum. I recently joined Central St Martins as Associate Dean of Research. So I'm getting to see all the fantastic projects at the moment that the PhD students here are doing. So we have a number of research strengths um, at CSM. Um, design for social innovation and sustainability is uh, quite a big part of um, our research landscape. Um, in particular, the, the group Design Against Crime, and also um, biodesign, biodiversity, and future materials. So we have something here called the Grow Lab, and the slide that you're looking at is by a PhD student, some work by a PhD student who is supervised uh, by Heather Barnett, who works in the Grow Lab. And um, she's looking at um, what, what mushrooms can do for us. So um, the, she's looking at sim fictioning, um, which is a term that Donna Haraway has used to um, describe trans species storytelling. So Sara is actually uh, living with the mushrooms and um, seeing how they grow and working out whether they can uh, be companions for unlearning and remaking potential queer histories. Um, 
Also at CSM, we have uh, architecture, spatial practices, and narrative environments. And there are several PhD students there. Creative and material processes and pedagogies. We've got a particular interest in creative pedagogies, ideas of care, collaboration, and ethics, and have several research projects in that area. Um, we have uh, graphic and visual communication practices and theories, fine art practice. So that's across the whole range of fine art disciplines as well as art and science, where we have a, a master's program, um, performance, art theory, critical studies, and artists' moving image. We have a, an interest in curatorial practices. Again, we have um, a, 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 a postgraduate program in curatorial practices and theories and exhibition histories. And exhibition histories um, is... Uh, something that our research centre, after all, that you may have heard of, it's an art uh, publisher, um, but it also does a lot of work in relation to Christian histories. Of course, fashion is something that CSM is very well known for, so we have that as an area of research. Um, the design itself as practice, the history, the theory and the curation of it. And we also have a stream of interest in popular culture. So the sequential art and comic studies, we have some um, expertise in that area. Um, our research students um, are very active. They've just finished an international conference that they organized themselves last week to go along with their exhibition. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing any applications that you send in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, and we're now going to hear about the London College of Communication and um, hear from um, the Associate Dean for Research there, Pratap Rani. Hello, <clears throat> welcome everyone. My name is Pratap Raghani. I'm Associate Dean of Research here and Professor of Documentary Practices at London College of Communication. Fantastic research environment. Um, when, when I stand back from the culture of the research and also our students, um, fantastic body of students, over, around 100 doctoral students at the moment, what strikes me across our disciplines, which is um, we particularly attract people from the schools which are uh, in screen media and design and what strikes me is the level of social and political engagement the urgency of their research in um, affecting social change um, on the slide here I've put on the left uh, of the screen as I see it uh, I've listed our research center Chris app um, <clears throat> sound arts research Centre. Um, we're also developing a new research centre that's um, evolving from our long established um, centre in photography. Um, and that will be that research area remains very vital and will coalesce around a new centre soon. I've also listed there uh, a number of our research hubs. You can see them in the text at the bottom. It'll give you some of the keywords, give you a bit of a sense of how the disciplines um, find a form. Um, I just wanted to draw out one or two. Uh, there is the uh, subcultures interest group um, that includes work on alternative and punk um, culture. And, and uh, on the top left of that image, we've got the comics research hub. That's a really growing dynamic uh, collaborative area. Um, in the, the history of, uh, of comics and the evolution of that form. Um, I mentioned uh, moving image, uh, particularly screen, and the way that that works is a very important area for us. And in the bottom left, we've got there um, the name of a, a kind of research area, screen and social change, and a new um, research hub for us called so the Sonic Screen Lab that draws together um, not just moving image, but important sound practitioners and the way that those ideas marry up. Uh, I want to move now to a few examples that the names you'll see on the right hand side of the screen. There's some examples there of our current doctoral students. Um, there's Wilma Stone. <clears throat> Wilma is from a Scottish gypsy traveller background. 
Uh, she's drawing on archival resources, including her own, to claim what she talks about as radical ancestry. And she gave a fantastic uh, big panel discussion at the last doctoral show that we have. We have an annual show called Unfolding Narratives, and we have a new edition of that coming in April. Keep your eye on the UAL website. We have a lot of open events for that, including panels with our current uh, panel discussions with our current PhD uh, candidates and they're showing their work. I think it's um, April the 8th for that week that that's happening and various moments where new people not already in our community but interested to find out more are very welcome. Uh, and then we have um, Linda Beckett. Um, her practice is in mark making sculpture and playing with sound and video. And she talks about embodied language, uh, the rhythmic and the flexible. And her um, underlying uh, ambition is in challenging patriarchal structures and looking at disrepair and renewal. And then we have Sivile Cesura, and her practice and her project integrates um, and then investigates material, affective and socio-political affordances of TikTok and its use among, use among refugees and marginalised communities. Um, she's asking the following question, how do refugees use TikTok to document conflict across borders and connect with global audiences? A number of our academic staff and researchers are active in that area of the media and conflict and the ethics surrounding that. I'll try and round up uh, now. And uh, last but not least, uh, up at right corner, you'll see an image there from the work of Alessandra Ferrini. She's based in the Screen School. Um, her moving image practice um, has been recognised at the Venice Biennale opening next month. That's quite unusual for a doctoral candidate practice to be selected for the main exhibition. Um, she's... Uh, been awarded many significant uh, prizes, include, including the Max Mara Prize. Uh, work interrogates the um, relationship between uh, the Berlusconi government and the Gaddafi um, government and how the politics of that played out in the media and the ideologies surrounding that. Um, so that's a little kind of glimpse. So obviously, research questions are really particular and you'll be thinking through um, what suits your contribution, potential contribution to new knowledge. But if any of these key words are of, are of interest, um, we have got a range of colleagues who are active in a number of different artistic practices. We're particularly strong in practice-based research, but many of our researchers also are text-only based. So we look forward to and really welcome your interest. Thank you. I Wonderful. Can... I could now hand over to um, the Institute of Creative Computing and our new professor there, Professor Nick Bryans Kins, who's research leader and professor in creative computing there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pratak. Uh, hello, everybody. So I'm Nick Bryan Kins and I'm professor of creative computing. And I'm, as I said, uh, head of postgraduate research here at CCI, which means that I look after all aspects of PhDs in the Creative Computing Institute. Um, my research mostly focuses on uh, AI and the arts, um, but the Creative Computing Institute has a wider uh, set of research agenda. So let me tell you a little bit about the Creative Computing Institute first. We're the only Creative uh, Arts Computing Institute in the UK, and we specialize in interdisciplinary teaching, research, and knowledge exchange at the intersection of computer science, the creative arts and the creative industries. So if that sounds exciting, we're the place for you. Um, we're quite new. We were established in 2019. We're research intensive, so we mostly focus on research and we lead conversations on emerging technologies such as machine learning, AI, VR, XR, robotics. And at the same time, we have a strong social mission and strong community engagement and local impact. So you see on the slide here that we have four uh, cre uh, creative computing uh, research themes. So the first one, creativity, machine learning, and AI. So how do we design and build AI systems for creative practice? How do we uh, understand how these systems work in creative practice and how they change creative practice? Second one is human-computer interaction. So how do we interact with and understand advanced uh, technologies? 
The third one is big data and citizenship, how we use and understand big data in the world around us. And our fourth uh, theme, research theme, is creative XR and robotics. So that is really about how do we blend virtual, physical, and augmented realities through creative practice. So you see that all these themes have a connection between technology and creative practice, technology in the arts, technology in society, uh, uh, and that's the interdisciplinary nature of our research. So on this slide, I'll talk you through um, some of the example PhDs to give you an idea of what uh, our students do. On this slide, we have Chia Fu's uh, PhD, which is on immersive data visualization. So this is about designing new creative approaches for realizing, communicating, and experiencing information in immersive environments. So in an immersive uh, situation where you put a headset on to interact with the data. So in this example, it's visualizing climate change. And this really touches on our themes of human computer interactions and how do we interact with the data, big data and uh, creative uh, XR. Another of my uh, of our PhD students uh, is Duncan Patterson, who's looking at multi-species computational art practice and how that relates to AI. Um, and finally, I'll just mention another one of our uh, PhD students, Anna Vaborowska, who is looking at machine learning and how that works with digital musical instruments in real time. So again, that relates to human computer interaction and artificial intelligence. So just to sum up, uh, the Creative Computing Institute is about the intersection of art and technology. We are looking for PhD students who are creative, who have an interest in emerging technologies, uh, people who are curious and with an interest in exploring the societal issues around these kind of technologies, and people with some aptitude for computer programming or maybe maths would be a bonus. So it's that intersection between arts and technology and interdisciplinary research that we're really focused on. And I hand over to Vida. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, and actually, I'm going to hand straight over to Felicity Coleman, who's going to speak to us about London College of Fashion. Felicity. Thanks, Vida. Hi, everybody. There's a lot of information to take in. Um, I'm Felicity Coleman. I'm the Dean of Research and Knowledge Exchange at London College of Fashion. And I'm also a professor of media arts, um, which means I'm interested in everything to do with um, media forms, media as a broad platform um, and from a creative arts lens, which is why London College of Fashion is a good segue to think about how fashion, we, we approach fashion in a slightly different way to what you might uh, look at um, in terms of uh, the Central St. Martin's offer or even um, Chelsea Campbell and Wimbledon where um, they engage in uh, modes of looking at theatre um, and you could do a PhD around uh, a, a, a theatre uh, over there. But at London College of Fashion, we engage in fashion and the fashion industry and which includes textiles and anything to do with fashion as a very broad platform um, and thinking about it in terms of its material production, uh, its consumption, its identity formation. Um, it's not just about um, the uh, actual financial value, the business of fashion, which we do do, but the social value um, and the ethical implications, um, as Pratap was talking about in relation to uh, what what kinds of things you can investigate in your PhD. So it's quite broad and we have a number of researchers that are both practitioners um, and theorists. So the practice covers uh, different areas of uh, design and, uh, and visual arts, performance, curation, thinking about the material artifacts um, uh, that the industry produces, the psychology behind uh, fashion industry, um, uh, that kind of business sense of predicting the future. Uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting arm in the uh, fashion, uh, in the business school that looks at um, uh, uh, statistical modelling, the psychology, behavioural psychology, experimental psychology of our material practices of engaging in this industry. Of course, it's one of the largest polluters in the world. Um, I think it's just behind the oil industry. So there's quite a lot of uh, PhD work and researchers who are interested in the sustainability side of the fashion industry, different forms of not just recycling, but uh, remodeling and reinventing uh, new new textiles from the micro level 
to uh, uh, different forms of adapting what we already have in the world. So that's a that's a very strong, um, uh, re, oh, it's a big research centre, Centre for Sustainable Fashion, as well as uh, curation and as well as business. Um, we are, I, I should say that we're situated in the East Bank, um, which is a really specific community that uh, we'd invite, uh, we're really interested in PhD uh, students coming in who are interested in looking at um, different kinds of community, uh, per perhaps uh, the Windrush community as a lost community, what they were wearing, what they were listening to. There's a few projects going on around that. Lost voices, lost communities. We're interested in different kinds of access to the arts. Uh, there are a number of researchers looking at disability in the industry in, in various guises. We welcome PhDs um, that uh, think about uh, well-being, health, um, and using creative solutions um, uh, to engage with uh, the, the, the issues that this platform of fashion um, enables us to think about. So anything to do with the creative industry and new business models that um, might engage uh, some, of, some of these topics, uh, welcome to join. There's more information on our, of course, I think Vida will get to this on our website um, that's public-facing. If you just type in London College of Fashion Research, you'll you'll find some more information there. Um, but happy to take any questions. Um, and handing back to you, Vada. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, as Felicity said, it's a lot of information for you to take in, um, and we're really just trying to give you a a taster um, for the work that you might. Um, do with us and the work that is going on at UEL across our colleges and um, institutes. So do explore the website. Um, there is um, a wealth of work there in terms of um, research activities and projects that our um, your potential supervisors are undertaking. Um, I think just to reiterate some um, common themes across all of our colleges that we're very interested in supporting both practice and theory-led approaches to research. Um, and that we're also very interested in supporting students that have a particular kind of um, social purpose will be the um, phrase that we use at UAL. And it was making a difference through their research and thinking about who do you make a difference to. Um, so remember, do get in touch with us, use the Q&A function today, or reach out to us by email if you have follow-up questions, and explore the website. So we're going to move on now to really think about how do we support researchers at UAL um, and the systems and processes that we use um, that you would benefit from as a student here. And so I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Alison Green. And if I, hi everyone, if I could have the next slide, please, thanks. Um, thanks, Vida. My name is Alison Green, and at UAL, I'm a reader in art, curating, and culture, and I'm also director of doctoral training and development at the doctoral school. It's really nice to be here. Um, so as a postgraduate researcher, um, you uh, will join a community of researchers and practitioners at UAL. Um, You'll be supported by a research development uh, and training program in the doctoral school and in your respective college or institute. Um, so we have a new space for the doctoral school in Holborn, which is in central London. And this is a image of a room that, that we call our collab space. It's just furniture. <laughs> <laughs> it's an early picture, but the doctoral school was launched in September uh, 2023, just this academic year, um, and we're uh, really activating it as a hub for collaboration, for sharing practice, for events, and for training sessions. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please. So... Um, Here's an image of, uh, actually it's it's Sarah again, Sarah Venor Reykjavik, um, who uh, my colleague Rebecca described before. And here she's pre presenting, um, presenting her work in progress at a symposium in February, a research symposium in February. And this was um, really beautifully 
during a, our social event. Um, and it was a, a presentation in the form of a badge making workshop. So she effectively was sort of trying out um, a research technique that she was going that she plans to use, uh, but in this kind of particular kind of peer and colleague environment. So researchers are supported by supervisory teams, and this is usually two members of staff, a few AL staff, sometimes three, um, and sometimes with external supervisors. Um, there are regular training sessions to support you, such as an induction program called Becoming a Researcher, regular series on creative and critical methodologies, um, on milestones, such as when you go through confirmation, which is what our name for, uh, for upgrade, um, and other milestones, such as sub submitting in your VIVA. There are also opportunities to present to your peers and to research communities, both within and without the university. Also, uh, session, uh, support for writing. So just to kind of uh, conclude this very brief introduction to the support system, um, I think we see training as tidal, as coming in and out of focus as your project develops, deepening and also becoming shallow, depending on your needs and where you are in the process. And we want to support, um, and I'm citing a scholar named Sean Wilson, both unanswered questions and unquestioned answers through the training process. So the next slide um, will show a short video um, that uh, documents and sort of gives voice to students who, who participated in um, an exhibition last year at LCC, which is part of a series of exhibitions called Unfolding Narratives. It's pretty self-explanatory, but it's an example of um, uh, a particular kind of opportunity to share research and especially research and pro progress, and that's in, through the form of an exhibition. So we will play this next, thank you. Unfolding Narratives 3 is an exhibition showing 13 postgraduate research students who are all at varying degrees of their research journey. The research happening is live, it's active, and people can even be a part of that research as they visit the exhibition. So research is one of the most exciting areas in what we do. As a university, we stand for the imagination in action. And one of the great things about showing work in progress is that the creator, the artist, the doctoral student gets to test out, try out their ideas in the world, see what kind of echo do they get back from that. And then that informs the development of their work. This was my first time doing an exhibition and this was my first time drawing something for an exhibition. I have a theoretical background rather than a practical background. This meant that I got to, um, that I got to collaborate with a lot of other students, which uh, I haven't had the chance to do before. Being able to work with the curator and the technician team has really allowed me to understand what I am trying to do with my practice a, a lot more. It's also been extremely positive to be able to engage with other students' work and to meet them. We're going across all different sorts of media, loads of different research methodologies, research and practice space. The different students have used the exhibition space totally differently. What a creative uh, institution or research environment can provide is really the space to explore where practice and where research sort of entangle. Uh, understand that sometimes the methods of research um, are actually part of your own practice. The value in showing research work is that you get other people to consider the things you're thinking about. Does it communicate anything? Does it have any value? What does it make people think about and how does it make people feel? It's not just what goes into the final PhD output, but the, but the process that refines your thinking in getting there and making sure there are windows out for other students, others in our community, members of the public, to interact with that work and get a sense of whether it has resonance and how it can have relevance.
Wonderful. Thank you, Alison. Um, and um, also thank you um, to um, London College of Communication for that lovely video documentation of that exhibition and the students that were part of it. Um, so we're going to move on into the kind of um, what you might call some of the more pragmatic and practical aspects of um, applying and um, sourcing funding and eligibility. So some more of the kind of nuts and bolts, I guess, of what it might mean to make an application to us and what information you might need to help support you in that. Um, so, and also just remember to keep putting um, questions into either the Q&A or I think the chat function seems to be being used um, and we'll answer you as we go. So we're first going to move on to speak about um, eligibility and the eligibility criteria. And I think um, this is Emily Ruff from our PGR team who's going to speak to that. Thank you, Vida. Um, hello, everyone. So um, the uh, standard entry requirements um, for entry onto our MPhil or PhD programmes are that you have a minimum of a 2-1 um, from your bachelor's degree um, or equivalent if you're not studying um, under in the UK or under the UK system. We do prefer students um, to have a master's degree and most students generally do have a master's degree, um, but we that's not a strict requirement and we do consider um, equivalent level um, experience that might be um, industry related, it might be research um, relevant experience. Um, and we would take that into consideration alongside um, your um, qualification. Um, if, you, um, if you are not a UK um, national and English is not your first language, um, and also if you are not a national um, of a majority English speaking country as defined by um, the uh, UK Visa and Immigration Service in the UK, then you might also need um, to demonstrate that you're suitably proficient um, in English language. Um, the ways that we ask um, you to um, show us that you're suitably proficient are either through a secure English language test, such as IELTS or TOEFL. Um, the IELTS score we require um, for this course is a 7.0 overall, with a minimum of 7.0 in writing and a minimum of 6.0 in all other elements. Um, we do accept other um, tests and details of those can be found on the English language requirements section of our website. Or if you've got any queries, you can also email us directly um, and, and we can confirm with you what um, requirements you'll need. You will need to take an in-person test if you're taking any of these tests. We don't accept the online home editions of those tests. Um, thank you. Passing back to Vida. Thank you, Emily. Um, and um, Jane, I think you're going to speak to us about funding. Jane Nobbs. Hello. Um, yes, funding. I've already had a few questions about this in the chat, so I'm, I'm hoping this slide will answer some of those for you. Um, so we do have six UAL fully funded studentships, which will be advertised very shortly. If they will be advertised in April, uh, they will be on our website, our web pages, and on findaphd.com. So do do watch those spaces for those studentships. They are project based studentships. There is a project being designed, and we are inviting applicants to join us to to do their PhD based on those projects. UAL is also is a member of the TECNE AHRC collab, uh, doctoral training program. And as a member, we're a partner, there are nine partners, nine other HE partners in, in the, that partnership. And uh, we, students applying to, who have been, an offer of a place at UAL can apply for a TECNE studentship. Um, the the time to be looking out for information about technical studentships is the autumn, and we usually have an application deadline for that of uh, November, sometime in November. Um, there, there is a doctoral loan um, available through the UK and EU settled status applicants, and you apply for that through the stu student funding system. Um, it's, it's, it's not um, it's not mean tested 
and it is paid straight to you. Um, so it's, it's not like a loan that comes to us as fees, it's paid direct to you. And it, a lot of our students do take that up and it does support them um, throughout, throughout the course of their time with us. On our website, you will find an alternative guide to postgraduate funding, which comes, which has actually been put together by people who've actually gone down these routes and explores lots of interesting ways that you can explore ways of getting extra funding for your PhD. I was asked this question earlier, it came up in the chat. Does UAL have an alumni fee discount? Yes, we do. 20% discount for eligible applicants. Also, um, for a number of members of staff, I've been asking me if we support UAL staff. And we do um, internal UAL university staff fees is supported for staff who are not 0.2 salaried or above and have completed, the, completed their probation period. And the funding is there for the first five years of part-time PhD study. Uh, all information about our funding is on the link shown on this slide. I would also mention that um, it's worth keeping an eye on our funding pages because studentships do pop up even outside of the ones on this slide. For example, I'm expecting that we will probably have a collaborative doctoral award, which is an award, an AHRC award, where you would be working in conjunction with a non-HEI partner. You'd be applying for a project for that. And um, there could well be an, another collaborative doctoral award as well. So do keep your eye on our web pages and look out for us on findphd.com. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, slide kind of speaks for itself. It's, it's informing you of what our 24, 25 fees are. Um, I'll just run through it. Um, for study in the UK, home full time 24, 25 will be 6,300 per annum. For part time home, 3,150. Uh, for international students, it will be um, 25,060. And writing up status for those, and, and writing up is for stu students post year three full time or post year post year six part time who might who might need an extra year to write up their thesis um, has a reduced fee, and this year that's one thousand and forty. We have PhD by published work, and the home fee for that is six thousand three hundred with the international fee, 25,060. Um, I've been asked quite a, we've had quite a few questions saying, do we offer an on online distance learning route? And we do, it's for international students only. And the full-time fee for that is 25,060, part-time 12,530. Do be mindful if you're looking at that route to check that um, online distance learning is recognized in your home country because not all countries um, accept qualifications studied under that, that method. Uh, we, we have a visiting student route where students can stay, come and, come and be mentored by us uh, for between three and six months. Um, and the charge for that is 1,960 for three months. All these details are on the website. Uh, please do email us if you've got any queries. Thank you. I'm now passing. Thank you very much. So we're now just going to go through a few slides that just help you think about um, how to apply and what you need to um, consider in applying. Um, so next slide, please. This is just an image from our website where you'll see a um, detailed breakdown of all those criteria in terms of um, application criteria, and also some good guidance on what makes a good application. Um, 
And the, obviously a key part of that um, is writing your proposal, which we'll come on to in a moment. But please do again, explore the website there that will really breaks down what we require, what you'll need to put into your application. Next slide, please. And I think Emily is going to speak to our next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have two entry points um, each year. We have one entry point in September and another one in January. Um, we open for applications for the September entry from the 1st of October in the year before, and it closes on the 31st of May. So for um, entry in this September, we will be closing on the 31st of May. If you'd like to apply for January entry, um, we will open for applications on the 1st of June and close um, on the 31st of August. And you can apply via our website and those links will be live. It, the website will ask you which college you wish to apply for. Um, you can apply for one college um, and it will ask for your um, mode of attendance, whether that's full-time, part-time, um, online, um, uh, distance learning, and whether if you're applying for the online route, um, whether, again, whether it's full-time or part-time. Just to note on applications, although I've said you may only apply for one college, um, if you apply and the um, college review your application and actually feel it would be better suited to another college, they will refer that on. So if you're not quite sure and you haven't been able to determine that prior to application, don't worry, your application um, will be forwarded on to another college if, if they feel it's more um, suitable. Um, when you apply, the, you'll be asked to complete um, a standard application form, so personal details, um, your qualification history. Um, we'll ask for a personal statement, which is about up to about 500 words. And the most important thing that we ask for is the research proposal, which we'll talk about a bit more in a moment. Um, and, and that's a document of up to 1,000 words. And there is guidance on our website um, for what we will require in that research proposal. We'll also ask you um, to give the name of two referees. You don't need to have your references prior to application. We will um, email those app, um, referees directly. All you need to do is give us their contact details. If you have already completed your qualification, so for example, you already have your bachelor's, you've already completed your master's, then please upload those certificates at the point of application. If you don't yet have them, that's fine. Um, if you will be getting them um, during the course of uh, of the year, um, we will make any offer conditional upon um, receipt of those documents. You also don't need to um, have your English language qualification if that's applicable to you in advance. Um, again, you, you can um, you can submit that after an offer is made. We have um, a deadline for um, submission of documents for entry, and if, if if you're wanting to start in September, we'll need those documents by the end of um, July or early August. Um, and if you're applying for entry in January, then we will apply those documents before the end of November. Once you've submitted your application, um, it will be then um, be passed on to the college to which you've applied um, for assessment. And typically those applications will be shared quite widely within that college um, to determine um, whether um, one, that your research can be um, supported within that college, whether it's um, currently at the required level, and to identify supervisory support. Um, the college will then let us know whether they wish to interview. We interview all applicants um, who, who are eligible for interview and, the, and we may be able to offer to. Um, our interviews are held online via Microsoft Teams. They're typically about 45 minutes long um, and you'll be asked to, um, to give a 10 minute presentation um, at, at the start of your interview and we'll provide details um, when uh, we send you an in interview invitation. We'll also provide you in advance of your interview um, with a list of areas that may be explored in the interview. So you have an opportunity to prepare those things in advance. Um, so it's, you know, it's a less stressful kind of um, interview. It's a very supportive interview to discuss your research. Um, once the interviews have taken place, you'll normally receive a decision from us um, within a couple of weeks of the interview taking place. And we will then issue your um, formal offer. Um, once you've um, had an offer and you've accepted that offer, you'll get enrollment information about six weeks before the course um, starts and we'll provide you welcome information then. If you're an international student who requires a visa to study, you require a student visa. We begin issuing CASs to enable you to apply for your visa 
three months before the start date of the course. So once your, your um, offer is unconditional and you've paid your deposit, we'll then issue you with a CAV. Um, we have a dedicated visa support team within our student advice service. So if you require any support in applying for your visa, you'd like to check them to check your documents or you've got questions about that visa application, they're there to support you with that. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Emily. Really super clear. Um, as um, we said a couple of times in the last couple of slides, a key part of uh, making an application is developing your research proposal. Um, and as I said, there is guidance um, on the website on what we're looking for in that proposal. Um, but a key thing might be you're wanting to start thinking about, and one of the reasons hopefully you've um, joined us to get some inspiration is well, what might you research? Um, and really that might be a problem you want to solve or a curiosity you have in, or in and about your own practice, or maybe a question you feel needs addressing. But really thinking for well, what is it that I want to research? What is, how does that research, what's gone on in that research field before, either in practice or in um, the theorizing and contextualizing of that question or that curiosity? And then thinking about, well, how might I go about doing that research? So thinking about your methods and methodology. So they're the kind of key elements we might expect to see in a research proposal. Um, and I think it's really worth taking time with that and knowing it will take time. You're unlikely to, to get your research proposal um, done all in one go. It's something that might take a few iterations. Um, in developing that proposal, we have um, a proposal development workshop, two proposal development workshops coming up one in May. So if you're thinking of uh, meeting the last deadline to uh, join us um, this autumn in the September start, that May date, May the 8th would be a workshop that's worth joining. Idea is being that you would come with a, work, a proposal in development or almost there and we can help you refine it and talk through and answer questions around what else it might do. And if you're thinking of applying for our Gen January start, then that July, end of July date would be the one to look for. If you're interested in joining those workshops, just drop us an email and we'll put, we'll gather a list and make sure that you um, get information about those and learn how to link to those events to support that application process. A key thing also in that is do pay attention, please, to our word count. <laughs> um, there is um, quite a tight word count in, in making your proposal. And that's actually also part of the skill of putting a good proposal together is how can I say so succinctly um, and really gather the information I need in a real clear, direct way. Um, once you've got a proposal, it might be that you have a particular supervisor in mind and you can research um, our supervisors through um, looking at our staff um, entries on our website. Um, or it might be that you've come across somebody's work that they've published or you've seen them exhibit um, and you want to approach them directly um, and you, you may do so, but please go approach them with a proposal in hand um, and they um, will be able to make a response um, and might also be able to help you, whether it's them or one of a colleague that might be the most appropriate person. Or indeed, you might want to reach out to one of our presenters today who lead PGR in their various colleges and institutes, um, and they will help direct you if you're looking to find a supervisor. Um, so that's kind of some thinking about preparing that proposal and the time it will need. So next slide, please.
So here's just a very short mention of some different application routes. Um, on the fees slide, Jane mentioned the um, PhD by publication route. So this is if you are a um, somebody who already has public outputs. So that might be outputs that are um, from artistic or design work or um, theoretical work in various kinds. Um, and it's possible to put those together and then write a short commentary about that work um, that uh, articulates how does that public work, how do those things that you've created and put out into the world constitute new knowledge? Um, and that would be the by publication route. Um, and that for further details on that, it's probably best to speak with us directly. So do contact us um, on the email that you see there and we can send you more information about it or invite us into a conversation about whether the kind of public outputs that you have and how they might be framed as a research degree. We also accept students who wish to transfer from one institution to another. Again, reach out to us directly about that and we accept those transfers at any time during the year. They don't have to be aligned to um, a particular start date. Um, next slide, please. So, um, colleagues, you have done a fantastic job in your presentations on giving us plenty of time for questions and answers, um, and we'll be calling people in um, to address them as we go. Um, but if um, we can get anything that's coming up. If, I think it's Jane, you're going to let us know if there are particular themes or topics or individual questions um, colleagues can answer to. And we have well, about half an hour, no, sorry, about 20 minutes or so to do this. So um, we've got a, a good bit of time. That's great. Yeah, I have. And I've got one here that I think um, all of all, all, all you can join in, but I think this is perhaps pretty to Alison, what kind of networking events are held to develop PhD students of community within their cohort, i.e. are there scheduled events that are specifically geared towards meeting other PhD students at the same stage of their study? Thank you for the question. Um, it's a really great one and a little bit difficult to answer, but I'll do my best. Um, so one of the reasons it's difficult to answer is because um, we are a, a kind of ecosystem or a network of a lot of different interest groups and a lot of different um, uh, so subject areas and um, people who are participating in the research culture across the university. So there's different responses and different kind of ways that those um, Relationships are supported um, depending uh, <clears throat> depending on the on the on the context, but examples will be um, things like um, uh, you know a series of research seminars that are sponsored by uh, a research center or um, a, a special interest group, um, and those are opportunities to bring uh, people together around you know a topic or a methodology or or a shared concern. Um, the, the training program itself, we, we aim, um, when in, in, uh, designing it for it to be very student centered, very open, very much about, um, establishing kind of relationships, uh, across years, across topics, um, um, and across practices. So, uh, I think that maybe there's like a, an approach to, to, to training and development that, um, is there to support that community experience because we know that um, being a uh, postgraduate researcher is um, because so often you're doing it as a solo practitioner, um, it can be uh, you know difficult to make those connections and sometimes quite isolating. Um, maybe the last thing I'll mention is um, this: the the idea that the network isn't only within the university, but it's without the university. So we try to prompt those conversations about um, uh, what our relations are, you know, to our um, to to peers, to family, to support systems, to communities, um, and this really 
is um, important, especially when we have our uh, fully remote learners or partially remote learners or learners who have um, connections um, you know, to other organizations at the same time that they're doing a PhD. So a, so a PhD student is not uh, a singular <laughs> being, but but somebody um, that's in, enmeshed and entangled in many different things. So thanks for the question. And I hope that gave you a little bit of an answer. Thanks, Alison. Um, I think the next question is probably best directed to Nick, um, although please, Others do join in. Um, Nick, there's a question to say, I saw on the website about PhD theories regarding theories. Would that include fields, fields like philosophy combined with AI? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so it, it could uh, be that sort of intersection. Yeah, uh, thinking about how you might uh, explore the philosophy philosophical implications of AI, these kind of aspects, that would definitely be something we would be open to at the Creative Computing Institute. I think I would um, reiterate that from our perspective in the Creative Computing Institute, it would involve some technology as well. So maybe you would use some model uh, AI models or maybe do a little bit of coding or scripting around them. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily mean building your own AI model. It would be the intersection between uh, theoretical uh, discourse and um, more the technical AI aspects. I hope that helps. Um, and I'll be happy to answer a question in more detail on uh, email as well if people want to email me. Thank you. Um, perhaps Felicity, you'd like to take one. As I am currently doing MPhil in art history, what PhD program would be suitable for me to pursue? Thanks, Jane. Um, well, art history is a broad church. Um, myself, I did uh, history of art as well um, and uh, find myself working in ethics of technology, using fashion as a way to uh, think about the world. So it would depend on what kind of art history you are interested in as a visual medium, um, uh, thinking about history of art as uh, in terms of visual practice, it, it would depend on which, which area you'd, you'd like to uh, pursue uh, a little bit further. I know that sounds vague, but we'd need uh, probably the, sort of uh, some top line, which region of the world, uh, which, which uh, uh, time, uh, place and so on to sort of uh, maybe uh, pinpoint where you are. But going back to the last question that Nick answered, another way to think about it is, and uh, I think Vida already said this, we do do cross-college supervision. So if you found a supervisor, perhaps say with Nick, who's, you know, let's take the actual material artefact um, and actually think about coding in practice, and then you wanted to um, reflect on it philosophically, you might look at, um, there's a number of philosophers that work in um, CSM, for example, uh, also um, at LCF. So it, it would just depend, but you craft your own project, as Vida said, you make your own project and explore that and perhaps uh, doing some of those uh, exploration development workshops might be the way to go if, you, if you're still thinking rather broadly. But um, as Nick said as well, we're really happy to help you refine it. So you really have to focus in um, coming out of, it could be one or more disciplinary areas. But it's, it's, it's a great, um, it's a great uh, project uh, to, to think on. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Can I just jump in there, Jane, before you, you go to the next question to follow up Felicity's point there about working between colleges and institutes? Um, I think it's also important to look at who might be potential supervisors. So you might say, oh, I'm really super interested in the research that Nick does on AI, and I also want to combine it with the research that Felicity does, for example. And then maybe there's an interesting PhD topic in that intersection. And, you know, you can reach out to the uh, potential academics and say, you know, I, I'd like to explore this intersection between your two interests. And that'd be a super cool way to approach thinking about a, a PhD topic. Actually, Nick, while we've got you there, there is a question linked to that. Um, is the Creative Computing Institute also interested in the intersection of creating computing and theatre slash performance? 
Um, let me just check that question. So uh, was it about whether we're interested in uh, creative computing and performance? Intersection? Yeah, sure. um, yes. yeah, for sure. Actually, we've got some interesting um, uh, topics in the Creative Computing Institute around uh, robotics and uh, theater and performance and how you, you know, not just think about, oh, let's have some robots in a room moving around, but like, what does it mean to, to be a performer, to be a dancer that's interacting in real time with moving robots that are also performing in a in their way, uh, whatever that means. Um, so we do have some uh, research that's currently going on in that space around dance, performance, and robotics. And that would also have a little bit of AI in it to try and manage the, the whole situation. Um, but there'd be various different aspects of uh, the intersection between creative computing and theater arts and performing arts that I could really imagine would be super interesting uh, for us. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's a perfect example of where that, that connection between the, the creative arts and the computing side is, is, is a, a really great place to be looking for a PhD topic. Yeah. Thanks. Jane, could I also just jump in there? Because uh, as Felicity mentioned, it's one thing uh, to specify about Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon is that Wimbledon is a is unique in the three colleges because it is a college devoted to one subject, which is performance, theatre, costume, etc. And they have their own nucleus of PhD uh, students there and it's developing all the time. And uh, yeah, so it's collaborative across other, other colleges and um, in various marvellous ways, but also that, that one college, Wimbledon, is where you would naturally tend to apply if you are interested in working on performance theatre costume PhDs. Thanks, Markham. Um, Rebecca, I think there's one here that um, if, you, if you could um, answer it. Um, can you describe the difference between practice-based and practice-led PhDs? <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> um, well, there are various definitions, but I think, um, and they'll be in operation in different in different places. Um, and so one could think of, um, uh, I suppose, the importance of practice to the research. So um, I think we generally think of practice um, led as being something where um, there is no division necessarily. So between the written element, because they'll, as you found out, there'll always be a written element, and the um, the practice that's being the practice that's being submitted. So the research is happening within the actual practice. You're doing the practice to find out the answers to your research questions. Um, I don't know if that's made it any any clearer for you I don't know whether someone can call to mind Frailing's definitions maybe um maybe and <laughs> the, they're very old they're, they've been very useful but they're very old and I wonder whether we need to worry about them so much uh, yeah, these days exactly it's That's a bit of a it's, it's a bit like how many <laughs> angels dance on the head of a pin really so I think what, what we're all emphasizing is that is that we are very fully committed, all of us across every college, to the idea that the and institute and research centre, the idea that the practice is and can be the focus of your research. And what that means is that you're the way the text might take several forms. You know, you might have a text that's a bit like a car manual that simply describes what's going on in the practice, or you might have a text that's more philosophical. But whatever you do, that whole package, the practice and the text, has to work as one submission. It's not you're not becoming your own, you know, art critic and commenting on yourself. You're doing one research project uh, with some textual elements, some practice elements, maybe some oral histories or whatever it is you're going to do. But all that has to work as one thing. And as has been mentioned and needs to be emphasized, and we will all emphasize this, has to be a contribution to knowledge in a field of inquiry. You know, PhDs, uh, it's not like somebody coming into your studio and saying, what are you working on? It's the reverse. It's 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 saying, what's everyone else working on? And what are they not doing right? <laughs> what's everyone else working on and what's missing? You know, and often PhDs begin with an intuitive sense of something that you're not happy with. You're going, well, why don't people talk about this? Why don't they do this? Why don't they really advance thinking in this area? So also important to consider. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, 
Peter, could I direct this one to you, please? Um, what support mechanisms are in place how students have a healthy study slash life balance? I certainly can. This is a really, really important question. There's been um, a lot of research done actually across the sector of how do we better support the well-being of research degree candidates, recognising that as you enter a research degree, that if you're part-time in particular, that you might well be studying with us for anything up to you know, five and even up to seven years at um, um, a raft of other aspects of your life. Um, and if you're full-time, then it might also be that you are, you know, dealing with being an in-depth period of change that research inevitably brings about um, whilst trying to complete this very um, intense period of study because whilst three to four years might sound like a long time, I assure you in the research degree space it goes very quickly um, and it will feel particularly pressured. So um, we have a range of ways that we support the well-being of our students. Um, some of those are attached to the wider university infrastructure um, to do with our counselling services um, and our support for um, candidates with different kinds of learning needs, for instance. Um, but we also um, have embedded elements into our research degree training activity that gives you some ways of thinking about and ways of working with well-being in and as research. And indeed, one of our um, forthcoming events, we run an open doctoral school um, and we have one coming up in May that is going to be looking at well-being in research. And a lot of that will also be thinking about well, how do I both understand this or auto activate this in my life and the way I go about doing my research. So it's very um, present for us. Um, in the way we approach you as researchers and the way we encourage you to undertake your work. Um, so hopefully that answers that for you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Pitar, could I ask you a question, please? Yes, please do. Go ahead. Um, what are you going to pull out of the hat? <laughs> it's mentioned in the proposal guide how we should cover the practical part of the research in the proposal. I guess I think what, what I was hoping you could do is perhaps advise on how they might bring that clearly into the proposal. Got that. Do you mind just reading it again? Because my volume dipped in and out. It's mentioned in the research proposal guide how we should cover the practical part of the research in the proposal. Thank you. Um, that's a great question, which a lot of us in the university, you know, staff and, and students are continually asking ourselves. So I think the question here is how we represent the practices that we're doing. There is good precedent for that. So there'll be examples that we can help signpost you to. But the truth is also that in some practices, this is up for grabs. There are ways of talking about some of those practices and particularly how we represent them, how we visualize them, how we document them. That's not, not fully settled. So in a way, that's a real opportunity to try and communicate through, I presume the, the question is maybe thinking about images or um, some form of, of media that might be recorded that go along with goes along with the text I just really encourage you to stay true to the practice and find ways of framing it in the text that accompanies that in your application that helps elucidate what you're trying to do so the um you know colleagues can can understand better the context the conceptual and the practice concept context in which you're you know developing your art practices Feel free to. Yeah. Can I just? Or, or, I don't know how much to bang on about that. We we've yeah. had you know, several hour seminars and so on about yeah. quite how we might do this, yeah. but I don't know what's useful. Yeah. I could just add a little. Yeah, go on, Vida. Yeah. So um, 
I think one thing to say in terms of submitting every examples of your practice for instance is to be really clear that you don't need to submit everything <laughs> when we're what we're looking for in a research proposal is you to show that you clearly understand where your practice is replaced in relationship to the inquiry that you're proposing so we'd be looking for you to be um, definitely evidence that you have a practice history and what that might look like but also clearly thinking about well, what of that background, what of that history, what of that expertise is relevant to this project? And that's one of the things we'd be looking for in a proposal to be kind of handled well. Can I just add, Vida, that's a really excellent point. And one way to frame it is to say, what research work is the practice doing? What is the research work this practice doing? You may have an existing practice, some of which is implicitly geared to for certain forms of investigation, but then in a PhD, you have to frame it formally. You have to say, the practice is doing this kind of research work, perhaps work that a text couldn't do. And this is why, and this is the kind of work it does. Thank you, Malcolm and Vida and Patap. <laughs> um, so there's been a number of questions about um, teaching uh, while studying at UAL. Emily, I think you've indicated that you'd like to answer this one. Uh, I can do. Um, I was just bugging it that it's uh, perhaps be answered um, uh, yeah, in the session, um, but that's fine. Yeah, so um, yes, there is opportunity um, to teach. We offer... Um, uh, what's commonly referred to as a graduate teaching scheme or something very similar to that it has a slightly different um, terminology um that, that you, you typically um after you've finished your first year there will be opportunities um to teach um to gain some teaching experience on um undergraduate um and ma programs and we'll provide more information about that um uh um, when, when, when you enroll um as part of our welcome program um but yes there are opportunities can I, Emily, can I just add there that uh, we we'll, we'll often find that we, you know, there's something we've been very keen on developing at Wimbledon and, uh, sorry, Hamwell, Charles Wimbledon, and that one of the, the things that really benefits students is they, they gain some hands-on experience of teaching, then they, they uh, in a group situation, then they might, if the courses take to them and like what they do, they might get some uh, associate lecturer hours which in historically have often developed into a small fractional post so it can be a way to start a teaching career however worth noting that the um uh each college runs a you know slightly different uh framework for teaching but the initial uh just in terms of financing the initial money available for teaching isn't going to make you a living uh, you know, the, the graduate teaching schemes are not going to be something you need, you can rely on for money, but they will introduce you to teaching and get you involved with the course. Thank you. Um, I've noticed that quite, quite a number of you have asked how you will sign up for the uh, research proposal workshops. Uh, Vida, um, I'm guessing we'll set up an event right that yes. yes um if the um if we can collect um particular names and people want to let them let us know we can contact them if they want to email us with their email address but we will be setting up an event right to be able to join it um so i think you know a lot of this work around how do i even think what a research proposal might look like um and that would be an opportunity to engage with that and um, we've also said a few times you might approach a supervisor and I'm very aware that for some people that might be like a really daunting thing to do or indeed how do you even start when there's such a wealth of potential supervisors out there um, and across our website so um, that is an optional thing to do if you don't feel comfortable doing that you can apply without um, having approached a supervisor um, and we will look to match the project you propose to our supervisory um, staff um, so that would be a kind of um, something to think about in terms of the way that you go forward with your application but in terms of the, the um, 
proposal development workshop. Um, please just drop us a line to let us know and we'll log your name, but it will essentially be a signing up through an Eventbrite link. Thanks, Peter. Have we got time for one final question? I think we do. Yeah, okay. If I could answer for this, my major is not related to fashion, but I want to establish a correlation between my major and fashion, despite lacking specific experience and knowledge in the field. Is it possible? And what is UAL's policy regarding this? Thanks, Jane. Uh, so I think the question was around if I if I don't have... Um... If, the major, if their major experience background isn't in fashion, but they want to establish a correlation between their major and fashion, is that possible with us? Yeah, sure. Th thank you. Yes, it is. Um, uh, as I said, the fashion industry is a very broad church. Uh, we have students who are working directly and rela fashion related uh, topics but others are just sort of springboarding around that in terms of um, I mean, the, the cultural and historical studies material artifacts um, science of parts of the industry um, costume for performance uh, identity issues we have students who are 3d printing lipsticks in the cosmetic science uh, area so anything, any way that you can uh, connect, it's also very much around, um, I think as, uh, as Pratap and others have mentioned, thinking about how UAL is very interested in uh, social values and social purpose. Uh, and so it doesn't have to be a, a financial value or a, a business related value, but uh, there are many ways into, uh, into this. Uh, fashion is just a useful platform for that, I find. So happy to um, uh, discuss that further if you wanted to uh, email me and and pick up uh, to take a further conversation. Thank you, Felicity, and all my colleagues. Um, we um, have come to the end of our session for today. Um, as we've said many times, please um, check out the website, please be in touch. Um, thank you for being with us and I hope you found it a useful session. Um, and we really look forward to seeing your applications coming through and hearing about all the wonderful ideas you may have to research. Thank you, everybody.